Hello FRK one to one students. This is Sonette Smith and this is a recording of the lecture that was due to happen today, which is Monday the 26th of September, the lecture starting on companies. Despite the disruptions on campus, we are going to try as far as possible to keep the lectures online now so that you can keep yourself up to date. We really believe that there will still be tests and exams this year. So we encourage you strongly now to make sure you keep yourself up to date and we will be assisting you online as much as possible so that you are able to do that. Just a bit of administration. Um, module test two was due to be written on the 12th of October. This date may change, but we'll keep you informed. It was going to be, well, it will be when it happens on chapter six, chapter seven and chapter eight. If we haven't completed chapter 8, we'll tell you up until when, up until which point you need to study for the test. There should be one more informal class test. The date was set for the 21st of October. That's the only one left. There is an online test on partnerships, chapter 7 today, which is available. It closes at 10 o'clock today. Please try and do that. And then on ClickUp under subject content, there is also a video loaded where Mrs. Clutter goes through question 718 on partnerships, which will be very useful if you need to go through a practical exercise where a lecturer does a question with you. So I encourage you, if you need more assistance with partnerships, to use that video. Even though it's now recess, I am giving you the details about the tutor consulting. This will obviously only then happen again once you're back on campus that you can consult with them personally, but they are available at one stop when the varsity is open during the times indicated. You could also email the tutors. Please make sure you send very specific emails. But right now, what will be These best are my is for contact you to get details hold of me. again. You will only be able to consult with me once the campus is opened again from the 10th of October. But you're very welcome to phone me. I'll be in the office most of this week. My number is 012-420-5900. And also send me an email and I will respond to you as quickly as I can. What I can also do is actually post um, links on ClickUp if there are things that people are struggling with that they need explanations for. So you please need to get hold of me and tell me what it is you're struggling with and what you need me to do. So the learning outcomes for today are that we're going to look at an overview of the different types of business entities, an introduction to companies, and then also the accounting entries for the issue of shares. So in South Africa, we have a number of different types of business entities. The first, the sole trader, is what we've actually been doing from the beginning of the semester, and you also did an FRK triple one, and that was covered in chapter one to six. Then the partnerships were covered in chapter seven, which you completed. We are going to, from now onwards, be talking about companies. Non-profit companies will be dealt with in chapter 10, which we're doing later on. Profit companies is this chapter that we're currently busy with, chapter 8. Closed corporations are going to be covered in chapter 9. The new Companies Act that we're going to be talking about came into effect from the 1st of May 2011. And since that point, no new closed corporations have been allowed to be registered. But there are still closed corporations out there in the business world, so they haven't got rid of the ones that were in existence before that date. So we still teach you about the accounting for closed corporations because you may very well come across them still in practice. The sole trader. If we think about the advantages, what we've been doing so far is the sole trader. And the sole trader, basically the owner and the business are the same. They're the same legal entity. The owner is the one who makes all the decisions. He's the one who receives all the profits. It's fairly easy to set up, but he has to pay personal income tax on the profits of his or her business. The business is not separate from the owner. 
The disadvantages of a sole trader is that the owner is personally liable for what goes on in the business. He has to be able to raise his own funds. If things go wrong in the business, he's the one who could lose everything. Also, if the business comes to an end, for example, if the owner had to die, all of the assets and liabilities of the business would be in his name or her name, and they'd all have to be transferred to another person. So it's quite um, basically what happens because the owner and the business are the same legal entity. The business as a legal entity comes to an end, and whoever takes it up then, the business over or takes it up, would the, then need to have everything registered in their name, so there's no legal continuity for a sole trader. The partnership benefits are very similar to those of a sole trader. Each partner is now going to be paying tax on his share of the profits or losses. In a partnership, the partners would have an agreement that says what each partner's percentage share is of the profits or losses of the business. The advantage is that because there are more partners now, there's an increased ability to raise funds and you've got a wider pool of knowledge, skills and contacts. So there should be um, a synergy in terms of there being more people available with different skills who are able to build up the business and to improve the management because you now have obviously more than one person responsible for operating the business. The disadvantages of a partnership are actually even more than with a sole trader because now you're not only responsible for your own actions, but you're responsible for the actions of your partners as well. So if your partner does something wrong in terms of the business, you could also be held liable for that. So jointly means you are, you are jointly liable, severally means you are individually liable. You can't transfer your interest in the business without the consent of the other partners. And if one partner dies, you have to dissolve the partnership. You learnt about how to do that. The legal entity dissolves and then you have to create a new legal entity with the remaining partners or um, you will add a partner and that also means you'll create a new legal entity and you saw you actually have to close off the books of the old partnership and then open the books of the new partnership. This you will find it doesn't happen with the company. So it's something that's unique to partnerships. So now we're going to talk about companies. And what happens with the company is now the shareholders and the company are separated. So the company becomes a separate legal entity from the owners. This is the big advantage of a company is that the company is now a separate legal person and the shareholders therefore do not become liable for everything that the company does and for all the debts the company incurs. Shareholders normally appoint directors and the director's job is to make sure the company is run properly. They might do it themselves or they might appoint managers to do it. And it could also be, especially in a smaller company, that the shareholders and directors are the same people. But in a public company, they're very often the shareholders and directors are not the same people. So the shareholders might, for example, be um, a big insurance company which buys shares in different companies and they then appoint are responsible for appointing directors um, who will then just be professional qualified individuals who they then entrust the running of the company to. The shareholders also have to appoint auditors for a company and the job of the auditors is to check on the directors basically and um, the shareholders appoint the auditors not the directors although you will find in practice that it's often the directors who do get involved in this as well but legally it's a shareholder decision. The directors have to prepare financial statements at least once a year for the shareholders it's not the job of anybody else. Their directors are responsible for that. The auditors then audit those financial statements and they then report on those financial statements to the shareholders, giving the shareholders an idea of whether they believe the financial statements are a fair presentation of what actually happened in the business, of the financial position of the business. 
if you study auditing, you will learn a lot about this reporting that the, sharehold, that the auditors do to the shareholders. But you will see in this triangle that the three different parties are separate normally, especially in a big company, and they all have different responsibilities. And in order for this legal entity, the company, to be run honestly without anybody um, using it for their own purposes, it's important that the directors are accountable, that the auditors check what the directors do, and that the auditors report to the shareholders so the shareholders can take necessary action if they need to against the directors. So the advantage of a company is that it's a separate legal entity. It pays its own tax. It means that when shareholding changes, the company just carries on. It's just the shares that get transferred from one person to the next. All the assets remain in the company, the liabilities remain in the company, just the names of the shareholders will change, but that doesn't actually affect the books of the company. And with a company, there's a pooling of capital. It's much easier to raise funds. Um, I'll show you just now, but it's much easier to raise funds, especially if you're a public company and are allowed to um, ask the public for money in terms of investing in the shares of your business. And then the big advantage is that shareholders are now not liable for the debts of the company. The only amount that shareholders should be losing is the amount they actually invest in the company. Um, they're not responsible for the debts of the company. The disadvantages are that there are set up and running costs. You do have to register. You have to comply with the Companies Act. One of the big disadvantages is you end up paying more tax if you're running something through a company. The company itself pays 28% tax on its taxable income. And then after they've made taxable income, if they want to distribute any income to the shareholders, we call that a dividend. And the company has to withhold 15% tax on the dividends that it pays to the shareholders. So if you were the shareholder or the only shareholder of a small company, that company will pay 28% on its profits. And if you want to take dividends out of the company, then you'll have to pay an additional 15%. If you were an individual with your own sole trader business, the highest tax rate you could pay is 41%. But now being a company, if you're going to take a dividend out, then your effective tax rate will end up being 43%. But companies do not have to take out dividends, but that is the way that owners are entitled to take profits out. But you'll see here it actually becomes then more expensive from a tax point of view. One of the other disadvantages, especially for public companies, minority shareholders don't have much of a say. There will be entities, individuals out there who own significant or majority shares in a company that will have the dominant voice in how the company is run. So minority shareholders, there are regulations in place for their protection, but it is a disadvantage that you don't have much say in what happens in the business. Companies are regulated by the Companies Act. This Companies Act was changed in 2008 and became effective from the 1st of May 2011. There are two types of companies in terms of this Act. The first one are profit companies and the other are non-profit companies which are incorporated for public benefit. We learn about profit companies now in Chapter 8 and we'll learn about non-profit companies when we do Chapter 10 later on. So there are four types of profit companies. The first one is a private company. A private company basically is a company where the shares cannot be traded publicly. It always ends with the words Proprietary Limited, which is shortened as PTY Limited. When we say these companies are unlisted, it means their shares are not listed on the Johannesburg Securities Exchange, which we call the JSE. So with a private company, it's not quite as easy to raise funds because you can't um, trade your shares publicly. They get traded privately. A personal liability company is something that came in with the New Companies Act. 
basically this company kind of company was set up for professionals like engineers, direct, um, doctors, um, accountants, where they can set up their business as a private company, but the directors will remain jointly and separately liable for the debts incurred while they were directors. So it means that the actions of the directors, who generally are the people who are the professionals, so the doctors, the engineers, the accountants, set up their company, they're the shareholders and the directors, they can't use the company to hide away from their own actions. They will still be um, liable for the debts and the actions of the company. That's if they are trading as a personal liability company. The name of the company will end up with incorporated or ink at the end. So if you see a company with ink at the end, it means in South Africa that that is a personal liability company. Then the major type of company is a public company which is listed on the Johannesburg Securities Exchange. It means you can buy and sell shares in these companies on the JSE. These companies will have LTD Limited written after their names. LTD is the abbreviation. An example of this is Famous Brands and I'll show you their financial statements. I have been showing those to you in the classes when I've lectured you in the past. So a public company is able to raise funds much more easily than a private company. Then the fourth kind of company in terms of the Companies Act are your state-owned enterprises. This is SAA, which has been in the news for the wrong reasons recently, Transnet, ESCOM, Danel, and there are others. So these are also companies in terms of the Companies Act where government is the shareholder and they appoint directors and auditors and they are also bound by the rules of the Companies Act. They also have to prepare financial statements and have them audited, everything that other companies have to do. State-owned enterprises, we normally refer to them as SOEs Limited. When you see SOE, it means it's a company which belongs to the state. If we now go and look at the financial statement of financial position for famous brands at the 29th of February 2016, this is the assets part of the statement of financial position. Remember everything you see, there should be three zeros, that means it's in thousands of rands. So if we look at the property, plant and equipment, it's 286 million. The intangible assets are 1 billion. These amounts, you would already have basics on how they would have been calculated because we've taught that to you in FRK 1 to 1. The other thing that we've taught to you in FRK 1 to 1 are inventories. So you see Famous Brand at 301 million rands worth of inventories at the end of February. You also have um, knowledge of how the, the um, bookkeeping happens and the disclosure happens for trade and other receivables and cash and cash equivalents. So if you look at the asset section of the statement of financial position, even in accounting one, you've learned some of the basics of how these various amounts that you see on the assets get disclosed in the financial statements, how they get accounted for as well. So their total assets at the end of February 2016 were 2,408,283,000 rand. If we now go and look at the equity and liabilities section, the equity and liabilities, we first see the equity, and for a company, this is where the financial statements are different. We'll come back to that now. No matter what type of entity it is, the non-current liabilities and the current liabilities are going to be the same. So you'll see they, for example, have lease liabilities which are non-current of 10 million and they also have current lease liabilities of 1.6 million and they are trade and other payables again these are amounts that we've been talking to you about how to disclose we haven't taught you leases as such but we've taught you about loans you will learn about leases in accounting two and three so under the liabilities, there are also major sections of the liabilities that you've already learned basic accounting for in Accounting 121. Bank overdraft, remember, if there is an overdraft, it means the, the company owes the bank money, then that bank overdraft is something that the bank could technically ask the, the company to repay at any point. So we always show it 
under current liabilities and it's usually always the last number that you will show we do want you to put things in the right order so the current portion of long-term loans will always go before trade and other payables which will always go before bank overdrafts for example the equity part of the statement of financial position for companies will look different here we have the issued capital and share premium. Share premium is something you won't see on companies that have been registered after the 1st of May 2011. That was the old companies act that allowed share premiums. So this amount is the amount that the shareholders paid for the initial issue of shares by the company. So this 125 million was received by the company when they issued shares for the first time to shareholders. It's important that you understand it's for the first time because subsequently if shareholders sell their shares the person who buys their shares pays the new the original shareholder they become the new shareholder but it doesn't affect what happens here the share capital only changes when the company issues shares for the first time so when they issue shares they will record this amount of share capital Every time the share, shareholding changes, they will have a register where they record who the new shareholders are, but it makes no difference to the company how much the shareholders then would have sold their shares for to the new shareholders. The only amount that the company actually records is the amount that they physically receive when they issue shares for the first time. The other reserves, you will learn about those later on. So these are also part of the equity of the business. And retained earnings are the accumulated profits in this business. So they have profits of 1.3 billion that have accumulated over the years that hasn't yet been paid out as dividend to shareholders. So if the business had to wind up, this amount is available to be distributed to the shareholders. You will see then there's a line that says equity attributable to owners of famous brands and non-controlling interests. Basically, these are part of the group financial statements. There are other minority shareholders who own a small stake in the company. In second year, you will learn about groups and then you'll learn about the difference between these two. For the moment, you will just be interested in this first part here is what you will see in the company financial statements that we do. But remember, equity is the difference between assets and liabilities. So this business is worth 1.5 billion to the shareholders at the end of February 2016. Just something interesting that you might have noticed in the news on the 1st of September, Famous Brands announced that they had bought the UK chain Gourmet Burger Kitchen for 120 million pounds which ends up being 2.1 billion rand. This is their largest deal that Famous Brand has ever gone into. And um, these Burger Kitchen are, are basically burger restaurants running in the UK. So Famous Brands already has um, brands that they own in other countries, but this is a major investment that they've made in the UK. And this is a link that you could read if you're interested in getting more information. So what you could expect is on the February 2017 financial statements, there should be a big increase in intangible assets um, of famous brands because of their purchase of Gourmet Burger Kitchen. So you know that already that that's one of their major assets. And obviously we're expecting therefore that their assets and their financial statements for the next year will have increased significantly. So the equity of a company is made up of the share capital, that's the amount the owners invest, the retained earnings, which are the accumulated profits, which haven't been paid out to shareholders, or accumulated losses. You can't pay out dividends, obviously, if you have losses, or well, you shouldn't be paying out. There are rules in the Companies Act about um, trading recklessly, recklessly, and directors should not be paying out dividends when there are losses but retained earnings are part of what makes up the equity of a company. And then we will be talking to you later on this week about revaluation reserves, which also go to make up the equity of a company. 
So equity still is assets minus liabilities. And this is all the amounts which basically represents the investments of the owners in the business. So if the owner, if the business had to wrap up, these amounts represent what the owners could expect, the book value of what they could expect to be paid out to them if all the assets are sold and all the debts are paid. So in the statement of financial position, this is what just gets disclosed for the equity of a company. And this is the part of the financial statements which are now different because we're doing a company as opposed to a sole trader or a partnership. So it's the equity section that is different for a company. For share capital, we have different classes of shares. In first year, we're only going to tell you about ordinary shares and preference shares. Ordinary shares are always the first type of shares the company has to issue. Ordinary shareholders have voting rights at the annual general meeting, the AGM. They're not guaranteed a dividend. Public companies often do pay out dividends, but it's not something that's guaranteed to be paid out. It's a decision of the directors. The preference shares are something that would be issued only after ordinary shares have been issued. We call them preference shares because their dividends take preference over ordinary dividends. Also, if the company had to go bankrupt, preference shareholders would get their money out before ordinary shareholders do. But preference shares usually don't have any voting rights at the annual general meeting. Unless their dividends are behind, then voting rights sometimes will kick in. All of this would be set up in the memorandum of incorporation of the company and also in the deal that the company will make with preference shareholders when they issue shares to them. One of the things about preference shares is that the company, when it issues preference shares, might decide that they will redeem or pay back the preference shares in the future. So preference shares might be issued and basically the company will receive money from those preference shareholders and the company will say to the preference shareholders, we will pay these shares back to you in the future. Then essentially what that means is that the company has a loan because that amount should then be classified as a liability because we've received money and we have to pay it back and that means that the dividends actually represent interest. In a case like this, the company will normally have a compulsory dividend amount that they have to pay at a set percentage. And we are saying from an accounting point of view, we don't show this as share capital then. We show it as liabilities. But if a business issues preference shares and there's no fixed redemption date, in other words, there's no promise that this money is going to get paid back to the shareholders, then that is part of equity. We show it as share capital and the dividends that we pay out to the preference shareholders will get recorded as um, an amount that gets spent out of retained earnings and it gets shown on the statement of changes in equity, which we'll show you later on in the week. So let's look at an example in your book, example 8.1 on page 220. Exemplar issues 100 ordinary shares of 10 rand each to each of the five founding members and receives the issue price on the 1st of June 2012. What's important to remember is that when a company gets established, they will have authorized shares that they are allowed to issue. So Exemplar might have, for example, in terms of their incorporation documents, have 1,000, 10,000 authorized shares that they may issue in the future, they've decided now to issue a hundred of those. So this does not necessarily represent the total authorized share capital. This is just what's being issued now at incorporation. This price of 10 Rand is something that the company decides on. It used to be in the old companies act that shares at a par value, but now in the news companies act Shares don't have any par value. We call them no par value shares. The value is set by the company at the time when the shares are issued. So the company would have decided they want to issue 100 of their authorized shares and the value they want to issue them is at 10 rand each. 
we have five founding members, so each of the five people who are members or owners at the time when a company gets set up are going to receive a hundred rand. And sorry, not a hundred rand, a hundred shares. So they actually have to pay for those hundred shares. So what's going to happen is that in the books of the company, we'll have an accounting entry where we'll have a hundred ordinary shares being received by five members. So a hundred times five, each share is 10 Rand. So the total amount that the members have to pay for their shares is 5,000. So we're going to receive the money in the bank account. That means we're going to debit bank and the credit will go to ordinary share capital, which is now part of the equity of your company. So these five founding members have put money into the business and the credit is represented as ordinary share capital. So this is a general ledger account in the, account of the, in the general ledger of the company. And this represents the amount that's owing to the shareholders. If, for example, the business had to get dissolved, this is the share capital which they should be getting back. This is their investment in the business. So the narration is issue of shares to the founding members. The process for issuing shares to the public, and this is the process for a public company because private companies may not issue shares to the public. In private companies, the shares get traded privately by the shareholders, but public companies are allowed to offer shares to the public. They have to issue a prospectus. There are rules about the prospectus. If you are listing your company on the JSE, for example, there are rules that you have to comply with. You can't just say anything in the prospectus. What you write in the prospectus will be checked. Auditors will have a look at it as well because you're offering shares to the public. You're going to be trying to tell the public why they must invest in your company in this prospectus. So it's something that you should always be perhaps reading with a pinch of salt, remembering the company does want you to invest. Um, at the time when the prospectus is issued, there's no accounting entry in the books of the company. You're merely telling the public that shares are available. Then there will be a period of time when the company will receive applications for shares and they will receive money with those applications. So the public will read that their shares are available. They will then decide that they want to apply for some of the shares. Remember, you don't only have to buy one share. You can buy as many shares as you want. So people will be applying for shares, they'll be paying. In the company's books, when we receive money, always debit bank with the total amount we receive, we will credit an account called applications and allotment ordinary shares. Or if we are receiving money for preference shares, we'll have applications and allotment preference shares. This account you'll see just now is a clearing account or a suspense account. We're putting the money to the credit of this account up until the date when the shares are no longer available. So we'll put a closing date in the prospectus by which point people have to have applied and paid. And up until that point, any money we receive could technically get paid back to the people who've applied. And we put it to the credit of this account. Next step is that the company will now issue shares or allot shares. That's another word for issuing shares. So they'll take the amounts out of the application and allotment account, which was credited, and they will credit ordinary share capital instead with the actual shares that they've now physically given to the people who applied for shares. So shares used to be paper documents. Nowadays, they will mostly be electronic documents which are issued to shareholders, telling them that they own shares in a company. And this then will be something that the shareholders own as an asset, as an investment to the shareholders. The company shows it as a credit. This represents the amount the shareholders have put into the business, um, what they've paid for the original share capital that the business issued to them. Sometimes there will be refunds. This happens when there have been more applications than there were shares available. What will happen in that case is that we will have to actually pay back money 
to people who've put money in. So when we pay back with Credit Bank and we will debit the applications and allotment account because it will mean that there were some of the applications we received where we were not able to issue the shares to them. So that means we need to pay those shareholders back. We're going to look at an example now of what this actually looks like. In your textbook, you must please work through example 8.2 and example 8.3. Look at them. They're fully worked out in your textbook and they also explain what happens when a company issues shares. I'm now going to be doing question 8.1, which is a question from your workbook to explain the issue of shares in a company. So here we have Sun Limited that was incorporated, established, set up, registered on the 10th of February. They have an authorized capital. Remember I said to you at the time when you incorporate, you decide as a company, as the shareholder of the company, how many ordinary shares you want to have that are authorized. That means you can issue them in the future. You can end up that you might only issue a hundred of these shares. There's no rule saying how many you must issue. But if you wanted to, you have up to 100,000 ordinary shares that you can issue if you want to. And shares nowadays do not have a power value. The value of the shares when the company issues them is established or determined by the company. So on the 15th of February, this company is a public company. They issued a prospectus. They've offered 60,000 ordinary shares to the public. So they had 100,000 they could offer. They decided to offer 60,000 and they decided to offer them a 2 rand per share. So that means there would still be 40,000 shares which they haven't issued that they maybe could issue again if they want to in the future. Or not issue again, issue for the first time in the future. These shares that they're issuing now, people have to apply for them by the 15th of March. So you'll have to make an application and pay in your money if you want to be considered for any of these shares. On the 20th of March, the company is going to make the allotment of the shares and they will allot the maximum number of shares that they're allowed to. And that means the maximum number of shares that they're allowed to issue. If there is an oversubscription, that means more people have applied than they have shares available, then they'll have to make refunds of the surplus. In question 8.1, in part A, we have a scenario where we receive applications for 55,000 ordinary shares. In the question, remember, we've asked for 60,000 ordinary shares to be issued, but um, we've only received applications for 55,000. That means we've had an undersubscription. People have not subscribed for all of the shares that we had available. We're going to record the share issue transactions in the general journal and then we're going to post those to the general ledger in the case where only 55,000 shares are actually applications are received and are actually then issued to shareholders. So our journal entry will be that on the 15th of March, which was the last day for receipt of applications, we should have received 110,000 in debited bank. The 110,000 is 55,000 shares times 2 rand a share. So that gives us 110,000. Remember, we wanted to have 60,000 shares issued, which would have given us share capital of 120,000 but we've only had 55,000 issued at 2 Rand, so we received 110,000. We first credit the suspense or the clearing account called application and allotment ordinary shares. So that credit balance represents the amount that's been put in by the people who applied for the shares. Now post of that, we will have an account in our general ledger called application and allotment ordinary shares. And at the 15th of March, the final date for applications, it has a credit balance of the money that we've received for people who've asked for shares to be issued to them. The next journal entry then is on the 20th of March where we actually issue the shares then to the shareholders. In this case, we can issue the full amount that's in our application and allotment account. So we debit the application and allotment account 
and credit ordinary share capital with the full amount of the shares. We're going to issue 55,000 rands worth of shares to the shareholders, not rand, sorry, 55,000 shares at a value of 2 rand each, 110,000 rands worth of shares to shareholders, and that means our ordinary share capital will be credited with 110,000 at the 20th of March. If we now post that to the general ledger, this is what it will look like. Our application and allotment ordinary shares account had a credit balance of 110. We've now taken out that 110,000 and we've credited the ordinary share capital account. So this now represents the amount that's been invested by shareholders of this company. The 55,000 shares we've issued at 2 Rand each. Remember what I've said to you, it doesn't mean there's 55,000 individual shareholders. We might have had one person buying all the 55,000 shares um, and that's quite fine. So you normally find that people will always buy more than one share. People normally buy shares in blocks and um, there will be a register that the company keeps of who the people are who hold the shares in the company. And the first time the company has issued shares, like in this instance, it gets credited to the ordinary share capital account. The second part of question 8.1, they are telling us we received applications for 80,000 ordinary shares. Remember, we've only issued, we want to issue 60,000. We've advertised we've got 60,000 shares available. But now we've had applications for 80,000. So this is an oversubscription. So we're going to look at what the recording of this looks like in the general journal and the general ledger. So our general journal um, account will, a uh, general journal entry will be, will debit bank 80,000 at two rand each. We will have received 160,000. We credit that to this clearing account, 160,000 application and allotment for ordinary shares. So this is to record the money and the applications we've received. Credit that to the application and allotment ordinary shares account. This is a clearing or suspense account that the balance of it should be cleared within a few days once we actually issue the shares to the shareholders and if there are any refunds due, we pay that back to the people who applied for shares. The second entry, remember we only have 60,000 shares available to be issued, so those are the shares we're actually going to issue. So 60,000 times 2 means we're going to have 120,000 worth of share capital. Of this 160,000 that was put in by potential, by potential shareholders, we're only going to give 120,000 rands worth of shares. We will decide based on the applications. What will normally happen is that everyone who applies, you will give them a proportion of what they've applied for. You won't give them the full amount because we've had more applications than what we had available. So that application and allotment account will be debited with the 120,000 and we credit share capital with the 60,000 shares that we've issued at 2 rand each. So in our general ledger, the, the application and allotment account will now have a debit of 120. You will see there was a credit of 60, a debit of 120. So we've still got to do a refund. We'll do that now. And our ordinary share capital account represents shares to the value of 120,000 that is owned by the shareholders now of this company. The next entry is that we now have to pay back the 40,000 because we received 160, we issued 120,000 worth of shares, so the last 40,000 has to get paid back. We're going to make payments back to the people who applied and we are going to debit the application and allotment account these two amounts together come to 160,000, which will clear the amount that we had in the application and allotment account. So this is what it's going to look like in the general ledger. We're going to have the debit to the application and allotment account, where we actually had credited bank account debited this account. 
So this account has a debit balance of 160 and a credit balance of 160. So it means there's no balance remaining. We received 160,000. We issued shares of 120,000. We made a refund of 40,000. We now have ordinary share capital of 120,000. Remember what I've said to you, that this ordinary share capital arises the first time a company issues shares. Now, if shareholders want to sell their shares, they will find somebody to sell to, especially if shares are listed in the JSE, they put their shares available in the JSE, people will buy them. And all that happens in the company is that their register that they keep, which is separate from the financial statements, will record that there's been a change in shareholding. Um, if I buy shares in this company and I pay two rand, and later on I manage to sell them for eight rand, that doesn't affect the company at all. What it means is that I've made a nice profit of six rand for every share that I was able to um, sell at eight rand. So um, when you are buying and selling after the original issue of shares, that is transactions that happen between the shareholders. Um, it doesn't affect the books of the company at all. It is possible that it, that you could issue and allot shares for assets other than cash. So, for example, Mr. S purchased 100 shares from AB Limited and he paid with a vehicle that was worth 25,000. So that means that the company will now have a vehicle. We debit vehicles, which is an asset with 25,000 and we credit ordinary share capital. We've given 25,000 rands worth of shares. It's 100 shares that we've given him and the value of the shares is 25,000 in total. If we had to think about it, it means each share that he owns is worth 250 rand. 250 times 100 will give you 25,000 rand. So this is a summary then of what happens when we issue shares to the public. The first thing is we have made an offer, usually by prospectus, and there's no entry we make at that point. We receive applications and we record the receipt of the applications first and we credit the applications and allotment account. When we've gone past the date of um, final receipt, then we record the issue or the allotment of shares so we are now going to take the amount out of the application allotment account and credit share capital of the company. But remember, we can only actually issue the number of shares that were available. So if there was an under application of shares, we will issue based on the applications we receive. So we obviously then can't issue all of the shares. That was example A where we had 60,000 available, but only 55,000 were issued. So then we only issue 55,000 shares. In example B, there's an over application. So in this case, remember, we had 60,000 available, but 80,000 were applied for. That meant we were limited. We still only could issue 60,000 shares and we had to do refunds for the over application of 20,000 shares. That's the end of the lecture for today. What you should do now is go through the notes in your textbook um, and make sure you do example 8182 and 83 again. In your question book, we've done question 8.1. You can now try question 82A, which is issue of shares and debentures. You can try question 8.3, which is issue of shares using other assets as payment. And then you can try question 8.10, which is issue of shares where there's under and over applications. That's as we did in question 8.1 today. Okay, so that's all for today. That ends the lecture for today. In the next lecture, we're going to be doing the note for share capital. We're going to be looking at the disclosure of equity in the statement of financial position. We're also going to be doing the accounting for the conversion of power value shares. Power value shares were shares that were issued under the old Companies Act and talking about how we convert them into no power value shares. So you can read ahead in your book 
and I will then try and load the second lecture as soon as I can. We were due to do four lectures on companies this week, so I'm going to try and load four separate lectures for you online so that you can keep up with that. As soon as we have any other information, we'll let you know, but please use my email address and send me an email if there's something that you need help with or something you want me to load. Good luck with your studies. Please stay strong and stay focused.